You're holding your families back. You're holding the men in your community back. And you're holding your coworkers back. These are some pretty intense statements that I better be able to back up or I'm going to be thrown in the dumpster out back. So let's work on that tonight, shall we? I got three things that we're going to cover tonight that are all going to stem from the fact that each of us is holding those around us back. First, we're going to acknowledge this uncomfortable truth that we're holding people back, and we're going to take a deeper look at what that is. Secondly, we're going to see what Jesus says about leadership straight out of Scripture. We're going to particularly look at the 13th chapter of John. And third, we're going to look at how to respond to this uncomfortable truth that we are holding those around us back. So let's dive into this first one. The fact that we indeed are holding those around us back. The Christian life is based on living a life like Christ. And Christ lived a life of prayer. He lived a life of asceticism, which is acts of self-denial. And he lived a life of fraternity. Those of us who have done Exodus 90, we're very familiar with those three terms. But those three terms and the Christian life, as we know, it's all based on Exodus 90, right? Or the other way around. <laughs> Exodus 90 is based on the Christian life. It's not just something we do for 90 days. It's based on the very rule of life that Christ gave us himself. This life of prayer, this life of asceticism, and this life of fraternity. I'm going to ask you a question here and really really ponder this. Really start to think about this. And I'm going to leave some time for you to think about it. It's going to impact the rest of this talk. Thinking about a rule of life, what we live, what we hold ourselves as a standard to. A rule of life is that standard that we're trying to ascend to, we're trying to live to, or making at least the bare minimum for us to live every single day. Consider a rule of life in all three of these things, prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. So what is your baseline for prayer? What's your baseline for asceticism daily? What's your baseline for fraternity daily? And what I'm going to ask you to do is take a look at prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. How much time in prayer? What kind of acts of asceticism? What kind of acts of fraternal life? What is the baseline that you think your family should be living? Not yourself, the members of your family. Take some time to think about that. What should their prayer life look like? Get tangible with yourself here. What should their aesthetic life look like? And what should their fraternal life look like? Stop here, think about this for a minute. Okay, let's start with prayer. Let's get some answers. What do you think are some baseline principles for prayer that your family, personally, not anybody else, just your family, should be held to? Who's got some answers? Prayer before name? meals. Prayer Tyler. Before. Tyler? Thanks, Tyler. Prayer before meals? Other answers? Daily rosary. Daily rosary? Morning offering prayer. A morning offering prayer? And the nightly, nightly examine, Matt. Matt says nightly <coughs> examine. Great, thank you. 20 minutes of silent prayer. 20 minutes of silent prayer. How often? Uh, every day. Every day. Every day. Daily yeah. mass at least twice a week. Daily mass twice a week. Week daily mass. Yeah. yeah. How about asceticism? Let's move into asceticism. Those are some good answers. How about asceticism for your family? What would that look like, either on a week basis or an annual basis or even a daily basis? What, what do you think that would look like? Tougher question for sure. Tyler, back to you. No electronics. Or <laughs> limiting electronics. Tyler has no electronics in his yeah. house every day. <laughs> He's a monk. Okay. Well, you said what should. That's right. What should? <laughs> yeah. So there's a big difference between what should and what is. I, guess I agree. Yeah, yeah. 
But I think uh, when it comes to asceticism, you need to find a center that makes you hunger for Christ. Either whether it is fasting, whether it is a, a, a type of prayer or whatever it may be, find that asceticism that brings you closer to Christ. Find the ascetic discipline that brings you closer to Christ. I found fasting helps uh, at certain times. Great. Thank you. Let's get a few more answers. I would say something like um, less shopping online. Less online shopping. Yeah. We don't believe Amazon is an addiction. We've got to get honest with ourselves in this culture. Yeah. I mean, clearly, like many of these men, like, abstaining from meat on Fridays is an asceticism, right? So hopefully, you're abstaining from meat on Fridays or doing some sort of repentance, right? Like that, that, that's what's required of us by a little church, right? So I'd like to throw that out there. Like we're either doing that or we're not doing that, but like we all should be doing that, right? So I'd clarify. That's good. Thanks, Father. One more. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, I'm just fasting before Mass, you know, for that hour before Mass, not including that, um, is something that's always... Yeah, fasting before mass, the hour fast before mass. All right, how about fraternity or sorority or community, however you want to define that word for the men and women in your family? What should that look like? What would be a baseline for that principle in your family? Yeah, that's Church right. activities. Church activity? So I presume you're meaning outside of mass, yeah. engagement in the church community in some way. How frequently? Depends on what activity you're involved with. But a commitment to a group is what you're saying then, in particular? Yes. Uh, doing something with the church, cutting the grass, decorating and leaning the church, yeah. or involved with youth, things like that. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> what else? Be, just being involved in one of the church ministries. Being kind involved of, in one of the church ministries. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Well, I really think it is Exodus. It's having a meeting on a regular basis with a group of men that holds you accountable to your faith. And I, I would, I would hope, I should, not not is, should, that my family would do that too. Find a community that holds them accountable to their faith. Outside of me. Right. Yeah. Okay. That exercise got harder and harder, didn't it? <coughs> it started out with prayer, which wasn't all that easy to begin with. But it's something that we all think about when we think about the Christian faith. We're always like, okay, yeah, well, we need to pray, so we should probably pray at least some amount. We've all been taught to pray in some way, shape, or form, to some extent or another. And so we probably have prayed with our family to some extent or another. But then asceticism, acts of self-denial. That became a little bit harder. Because why? Are we doing it regularly? And then we moved to fraternity. That became even harder yet. Whether we practice prayer and asceticism before or not, it's very evident whether or not we're practicing fraternity right now. Are we meeting regularly ourselves? Is our family meeting regularly in some sort of community that can hold them accountable right now? on a consistent basis, or not. My next question, as we stem the this, as we try to tease out this issue, you have set, or tried to set, that baseline for your family. What would that baseline be for your friends? Would it be more? Would it be less? What if the community decided, just the general public, decided on what the baseline rule of life should be for your family? Would it be more? or less than what you decided for your family? I heard an answer over here saying way less. Yeah. Way less, okay. That should make us feel pretty good about ourselves. All right, we have a standard in the Christian life that's higher than the general public. That's good. Okay, what if Father decided what the baseline rule of life was for your family? Would it be more or less? <coughs> <laughs> now how good about ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> 
right. Here's the, the closing of this overall truth, man. We kind of have two options when it comes to living this or uh, setting a standard for the people around us. We can, we, all, we don't want to be hypocrites. So instead of being holier, we hold people back. What the life that we are living usually sets a standard for those around us. Right? So if we're not living a life of prayer, asceticism, and fraternity regularly, why would we set a standard higher than that for our family? Or higher than that for our friends? Or higher than that for our coworkers? And so we have those two options. We can either grow in holiness and start to raise the bar and then call on the people around us. Or we can just sit back and be like, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I'll just keep the bar kind of low. And we can keep doing that and making life easier and easier for us until we fall to the just general standard of community. We're called to be the heads of our household. If we hear Father having a bar higher than us, why are we not raising that bar for our families as well? Whom, as much as Father might love, we really ought to be loving in an even more personal way. Ought to be desiring their holiness, desiring their sanctity, de desiring them to be with Jesus Christ even more. We, my friends, are holding back our families from holiness, holding back our community from holiness. But is this a Christian mentality? Is this a Christian fact? Let's take a look at what Jesus has to say here and move on to the second portion of tonight's talk. What Jesus has to say about leadership. This is from John 13. And we're going to start John 13, verse 16 here. All right? So this is at... at the Last Supper, John 13, 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. This is pretty much what we've just been laying out right here. If we're called to be the heads of our household, we are going to limit our household. And you might say, well, like, yeah, I mean, but they could ascend to something greater. Like, my wife is more holy than me. My children could, like, go to Catholic schools and become more holy than me. Like, what about that? Yeah, and what if you raised the bar yourself? Would they get holier yet? Even if they are still holier than you, would they get holier yet? We are limiting our households. Father can only do so much from a distance, but the father of the household can do much more. Well, what does Jesus mean by this then? In order to understand verse 16, it's probably good to read verse 15. So let's go back a little bit here. Jesus says to his apostles, For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. I've given you an example. You also should do as I have done to you. This is a pretty big statement for us. If he is our master and he's calling us to do what he did for us. He is saying this literally the very verses after the washing of the feet. Where he got down on his knees, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. That is a huge thing. That he would follow that up with this. Not only am I going to wash your feet, but I'm going to tell you to do as I have done. And let you know that no servant is greater than his master. This is a lot of stuff happening right here that puts a good amount of weight on our shoulders. A weight that some might say is a little bit too much for us to handle. And I would agree with that. It is too much for us to handle. The salvation of our family, our neighbors, our friends, it is too much for us to handle alone, apart from God, apart from His grace. We must be attentive to His grace, must be receptive to His grace, must be open to His grace if we're actually going to live the life that He desires for us, if we're actually going to raise our bar and lead those around us closer to Jesus Christ. I'll tell you a story. Back in 2016, there was this man who found himself to be a very good father. He would always be reading parenting books. Loved to read these parenting books, loved to dive into all these different parenting practices, and teach his kids everything that they needed to know. He was going to be the best father. Then his kids became teenagers. And life became hard. And they started to get a little rebellious. And he started to have problems with these kids. 
And so he said, wife, we're going to go see a family counselor. These kids need serious help. So they go in. They see a family counselor. Family counselor looks at the, the father and says, okay, what's the problem with the children? And the man says, these kids are lazy. They won't get off their phone. They eat whatever they want, whenever they want, as much as they want of it. And at any sign of hard labor or work, they just sit there on the couch. The wise family counselor strokes his beard because it's very good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and he turns to the wife and he says to the wife, tell me about this. Tell me about him. The wife says, well, he's kind of lazy. He's always on his phone. He eats whatever he wants, whenever he wants, as much as he wants of it. And at any sign of hard labor, he just sits on the couch. The husband goes, whoa, 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 here. We're, we're, you're here to talk about the children. All right, we're here to talk about the children. We got a problem with the children, okay? The counselor looks at the man. He goes, you want to fix the children? I want to fix the children. You want to fix the children? Fix yourself. No matter what the man said, no matter what words that he shared with his children, his actions spoke way louder. The very life he was living set a tone for those around him, whether that be for his spouse or certainly in this case, or his progeny. They saw the life he lived, and no words could overcome that. We're in the same boat, man. Are we living a life that models Christ? Does it look like this? Because no matter how much we talk about this right here, if we aren't living it, we are interrupting that message to whoever we are preaching it to. We are giving them contrary pieces of information. Certainly the Holy Spirit can overcome that, but man, would he really be delighted if we participated in his mission and actually worked with that message, allowing it to change our lives as well. So man, let's move on to the last part here. How do we respond? How do we respond to this truth that we have? This truth that we are holding others back. The way in which we respond is indeed living the Christian life, living it more fully, living it more perfectly. And I'd like to share kind of a, a story of my own life, my own kind of discovery of this Christian life with you. I remember being back in seminary, and the first year of seminary was extremely difficult. I followed every rule to a T. Exactly what they wanted me to do, I did. If it was in the rule book, I did it. If it wasn't in the rule book, I didn't do it. Just enough to get by. Obedience without an actual heart for God. I knew that I needed to be a seminarian because God needed help. I mean, look at me. I'm pretty good, all right? And there's all these priest problems. Clearly, I could help. I didn't become a priest. And there's probably some reason for that. But in that first year of seminary, I started just to be broken down little by little by little. And when it came to the second year, I realized how much time I wasted in that first learning about prayer, asceticism, and fraternity, but only doing them out of obedience, not doing them out of love for our Lord, not doing them out of a deeper relationship, just obligation. In that second year of seminary, I opened my heart to the Lord more fully and started to engage Him and allow Him to change my life from the inside out, not just the actions, but really the heart and the mind. I wasn't called to be a priest. The Lord clearly didn't need my help. And I moved on. As I moved on, I decided I still wanted to serve the church, and so I became a missionary. I became a missionary with the Fellowship of Catholic University students not too long after I ended my time in seminary. And at some point there, you know, I'm living this fully Christian life, full-time missionary life. I would have told you at the time, yeah, I'm a pretty darn good Christian. Look at me, okay? I even make a big paycheck off of this that I get to fundraise myself. Clearly, I'm a good Christian, okay? And then I get a phone call one day. It's from a young lady who knew that I was in seminary before. We were friends at that time. And for whatever reason, probably better reasons than I've described right now, looked up to me and desired to grow in holiness. And she called me up and she said, hey, I've been reading a lot of Therese Lisieux. And Therese prays and fasts for those she loves. And I know you're a missionary and you're called like really invest in a few people on college campuses. How do you pray and fast for those that you love and those that you're serving. 
And I'm on the other side of the phone and I'm just like, uh, I don't. <laughs> and on the other side, she just goes, uh, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to call you out there. I was just looking to be inspired. <laughs> yeah. That moment was really beautiful. Was I doing a holy hour? Yes. Was I aware of prayer and fasting? Yes, could have given you an entire talk on prayer and fasting. But especially the fasting part, was I doing that? That phone call came in like September. That's months from Lent, okay? Lots of months. So I had done it before and would do it again the next year, but I mean, not right, it's September, okay? <laughs> We've got college football and stuff to worry about here. <laughs> so I wasn't really living that life. It made me think back to my time in seminary and ask the question, if I thought that I was living this fully Christian life, why did I feel so called out by this phone call, this good phone call from a good friend who had good desires for me? I had to think, what was setting that time in seminary apart? And it indeed was all three of these things combined. Yes, we had a beautiful prayer life, required mandatory holy hour every single day. Yes, we had an ascetic discipline, Every Friday, certainly, there was a fast until 3 or 4 p.m. And then we had other things of which we would fast from. Technology, uh, recreational things, different things that we would pick and fast from as a community, which was great. And then we had fraternity, certainly forced fraternity at the beginning, but a fraternity of guys who really loved you, whether you got along with them super well or not, whether you find them to be good and solid or fun guys that you'd otherwise be friends with or not. They loved you. They held you accountable. They pushed you to be a better man. And I thought back to that time and I said, okay, well, are those things just for men who are called to be priests? Or are these for all Christians? And certainly, I turned to Scripture and started to read. And it didn't take long to see in the Old Testament that all three of these things were right there. Prayer, asceticism, and fraternity all existed in the Old Testament. Well, how about the epistles? We're not an Old Testament people. What about the New Testament? I'm now seeking to find an out because I sure didn't want to live asceticism the rest of my life. So I'm looking at the epistles. I was like, all right, what do you got for me, Paul? Ooh, bad example. Let's pick a different one. That guy suffered joyfully a little too much. Maybe somebody else has something else to say. But indeed, asceticism existed there and eternity as well, and certainly in prayer. But if I didn't get it in the Old and the New Testament, I only had to look to the Gospels. This was so important to God, prayer, asceticism, and fraternity for all his people, all time, that not only did he write it in the old and the new, the man became incarnate and came down from heaven himself and modeled the life for us. Living daily prayer, living daily acts of asceticism, living fraternity with 12 smelly dudes on a camping trip for three years. <laughs> the guy did this. Our God did this for us. He cared so much for us and desired so much for us to live this life. So I knew that there was no option moving forward. I had to live all three of these things, prayer, asceticism, and fraternity, if I really wanted to live the Christian life. Men, for those of you who have done Exodus 90, consider your life post-Exodus. What has it looked like? Have you continued to live a life of prayer, asceticism, and fraternity daily? Daily. If you want to be my disciple, you want to follow after me. This is Luke 9, 23. Deny yourself. Take up your cross for 90 days a year. That sound right to you? Take up your cross daily and follow me. And what's our cross when we think of that man? Is it our sins? Uh, no. Our sins are actually far too heavy for us. We need to take our sins to the confessional and offload them to the only one who can carry them. Jesus Christ himself. This is his cross that he already chose for us. We have a different cross. Our own sufferings in our daily life. Those that are, that are put on us, that we encounter, that we can't minimize. They're real things. They're real sufferings. And we have the choice to joyfully take up or not, to joyfully unite to the cross or not. Then our own acts of asceticism, the ones that we choose, the ones that we can lift up on behalf of those that we love. 
the ones that we can unite to the cross so that we indeed are living the Christian life every single day of the entire year. What about the Easter octave, though, bearded man? How about those days? Can't we get a little reprieve? <laughs> Think about our good brothers, the Franciscans, or any other good religious order out there. Do you see a Franciscan on Easter Monday kicking up his feet, watching the Final Four, eating whatever he wants in a plain white tee and some gym shorts? Probably not. Now, is that Franciscan friar going to still go to prayer that day and commit, uh, complete the very life that he already committed himself to living? Yes. Is he going to wear his habit that day? Yes. Is he going to have a big, fat, juicy steak at dinner because it's Easter? Absolutely. You better believe it. These things can go together. Yes, the disciplines will let off, but not go away in the Easter octave. And they might let off a little bit throughout the year, but not go away. St. Francis himself knew this very well, which is why he came up with St. Michael's Lent. The second Lent through the year that goes from the Assumption of Our Lady to the Feast of Michael Lent, the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel. This 40-day period of time where he's like, look, I know myself. I know myself so well. I know that I did a great Lent, last Lent. And that was a long time ago. And I started to slip back. I started to not live the life that I know I need to live. I started to think, he probably didn't think this, but you can. Wife, I love you so much, I'll, I'll take cold showers for you for 90 days. Okay, what about after that? Don't you love me then? Next year I do, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> I love you every day. I will take up my cross for you every day. When I go to work, I am going to go to sacrifice for you. That's what I'm going to do when I leave this building. When I leave my house, sacrifice for my wife. Instead of sliding back, we get this time as we begin fall and close out summer to follow St. Francis in this time of a second Lent to discipline ourselves back once more into the life we know we ought to be living all year round, at least to some degree or another. What a gift. What a way to live the Christian life. What a way to model ourselves after Jesus Christ himself. So men, it has to be more than 90 days. And it has to be today. I'll share one last story before we wrap up here on why it has to be today. I got a friend back and forth. Her name's Angie Montgomery. She's a good friend of mine. And she works for this ministry that she started called Made Strong Ministries. Her and her friends, uh, the gals that she works with, they go into exotic dance clubs. They befriend the dancers in those exotic dance clubs, and they strive to have meals with them outside of that time frame of which they're working, so they can lead them closer to Christ. She shared with me, amidst the extremeness of this mission, that 30 to 40 percent of the women in the dance clubs just in Fort Wayne, Indiana, no big metropolitan area, just in Fort Wayne, 30 to 40 percent of these women are trafficked. If we don't think that the time is right now to start living our life, to start taking up our cross daily and making offerings for those we love, for those in the church, for those in our workplace, for those who think they might be going to a dance club to pay some girl's tuition, to help her get through college, then we are misunderstanding the signs of the times, my friend. There is no better day to start. There is no other day that we ought to start living this life of prayer, asceticism, and fraternity than right now. For the spiritual battles that are happening before us are ever more real than the very things that we see before us. And Satan is having a field day. It's time for us to actually live as Christ desires us to live. Looking back at the outline for this talk here, we, this uncomfortable truth, are holding back those that we love from living the life that Christ wants them to live most fully. Christ knows that we ought to be living as he lived, that we must live the life that he modeled for us, that we must put a towel around our waist, get on our knees and start washing feet, denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily and following after him. To model this life for those that we love. 
Man, I hope you respond to that. I hope you see that need. And I hope you start living a life of prayer, asceticism, and fraternity, not just 90 days of the year, but the entire year. I'll be praying for you that you might do this. Please, please pray for me also. Thanks, man. Any Q&A? Any Q&A for Daniel? Man, I just nailed it tonight. Uh, I, nailed it. I do that. How big is Exodus 90? How big is the group that is the fundamental core of Exodus 90? The team? Yeah. We have seven men on our team. By the end of this year, we hope to have 14. So pray for us, because that's going to be a huge change. Doubling the size. Yeah. And how many men have done Exodus 90? Like, red, I mean, no, I mean. It's international. That, that was a question I'm asking. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so last year we had something like 15,000 go through just to Easter time. Uh, total, in the seven years that we've been in existence, it's been about 60,000 men in 70 some countries, all 50 states. And we translated into a few different languages as well. So you have a big fraternity around the country, around the world. Right. Is, is this the inaugural St. Michael's Lent? This is, Lent? yeah. This will be the first St. Michael's Lent, and it starts on Monday, Monday. the 15th. Huh? Yeah. So you're welcome to gather. I think it starts on the 16th. It's, no, it starts on the 17th. I did the math. Well, it's not 40 days anyway, like Lent. It's 40 days. Yes. The thing, sorry. <laughs> yes. How long have you been doing this? When was it created? When did it begin? So it started seven years ago. A priest, Father Brian Doerr, started this in a seminary, okay. even before seven years ago, and then about three years before that. And there was no reading and reflection. They just, a few guys in seminary met with Father Doerr every day and lived prayer, asceticism, and fraternity in an intentional way. After that, he's like, well, if these guys need it in seminary, these holy guys, and they're still screwing up, they're still addicted to pornography or video games or overeating and alcohol or whatever, what about lay guys? How do we help the families? And so Father Doerr decided I'll write 90 reflections on the book of Exodus and see if guys do this. So that was in existence for about three years or so. I joined the team, kind of cleaned it up, and made it um, more for laymen, if you will, adapted it more even so for laymen. And uh, so I've been on the team for four years and developed the buildings. So you've been doing it four years. They were doing it for another three prior to that. That's right. Um, that's really right. Well, just like I, I really enjoy reading daily reflections. I read Bang Bang Among Us because I really like to try the old, tie the old with the new and things like that. But uh, your reflections are amazing uh, in comparison to a lot of things I read. They really, I usually get a really good takeaway. And I'm also intrigued, I don't know if it's Holy Spirit or intentional on your part. So I just finished, I did Exodus and I did Genesis now. And, moving into Joshua's library. But the daily readings in Genesis or Exodus, they seem to tie right in with each other. Was that it? It seems like it had to be intentional um, with the liturgical cycle. Uh, or is it just that God's word that ties Yeah, that's just God's, God's, God's word. Yeah, yeah. But I do need to stop <laughs> because you just complimented them. So um, they're all, but the, just right. stop. <laughs> this is what this is what men don't understand. Is that you will never know your potential, and you will never know what God can do with you until until you start practicing prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. And even the vast majority of priests, bishops, and people who work in the church aren't doing that. As sad as that is. What he's mentioned about like the Franciscan friar the day after Easter, a lot of them are in basketball shorts and, a, and an undershirt and don't do anything. Like it's not him, it's what it is. It, it literally is the Holy Spirit that channels through people who make themselves available. And what prayer, asceticism, and fraternity allow is for one to be available to God. Like that's what happens. And like when you begin to fast, particularly like serious fasting, like and prayer, and prayer, like 
that you will see like things happen in your life like you that you could never imagine. I'll just and I I will say it because like, like we just did a nine day potato fast. Nathaniel and I did. We ate nothing but potatoes for nine days straight. Right? In honor of St. John Vianney. And I, I, I can attest to the fact that I, I, I saw prayers answered. I saw a, like miracles happen. Like, and I've never in my life, as a, as a priest, like, even as a, like, like a layman, like when I was so, so, like I've done fasting before, but like that nine day potato fast is one of the like, like the most extreme things that I've ever done. But I also saw like some of the greatest fruit born from it. And like when you when we start embracing these things to the full, like you you will see fruit born. And you will like you'll enter into the cross. And it's it that's where God bears tremendous fruit. So I'm gonna stop talking about it. Like, I just need to like like that's why. Like that's the difference. A biblical scholar, any any an atheist could pull out biblical commentaries and write a reflection. But someone who's living in union with God is going to bear more fruit. Like there's a difference between scholars and saints. It's great when they're together, but that means scholars need to be on their knees, and that often doesn't happen. I'll stop. Here. Sorry. There's this image of that will be very apropos right now because it's hot. Let's say you had no AC in your house, huh? You have options. You could open a window or you could open two, or all of them. And especially on a breezy day, you probably want the most windows open possible. Mm -hmm. Grace works in a similar way. We can open one window of grace, but the Holy Spirit is often depicted as wind into our house, and that could be prayer. But if we start to fast, and we start to live fraternity, we just open more windows that we otherwise leave closed and limit what the Holy Spirit can do in our life. We live the fullness of the Christian life, we open all the windows and allow ourselves to be very attentive, allow our house to no longer be stuffy and keeping our family confined, but really let the Holy Spirit in and through. I hope that image works for you guys as well. Do you have a question? Yeah, in terms of uh, in this day and age where you, know, you have your core family, like as you get older and your family scatters literally coast to coast, corner to corner, in terms of as the father, grandfather of this extended family, how does this action be implemented with family in California, Massachusetts, New Orleans, on a day-to-day -day basis? How can it be implemented from from above, like from Exodus, or how? Serving, you? serving your family in terms of working towards helping your family to get closer to God, helping your family to be. Yes, you're saying if you personally have family yeah. across the country, how can you help? How do you put this into action when your family's scattered all over the place? Yeah, and you're, you're maybe particularly, in your case, talking with children also. Adult children yeah. and grandchildren. Yeah. So one way you can do this, with first of all, you can talk to them about it, right? And if they're open to listening, that's great. You you're still can teach your children plenty of things, right? Hey, listen, I, I learned about this, I learned about that. And that one-on-one -on -one time, actually going and spending time with them is certainly first and foremost uh, where we should be spending that time. Now let's say they don't listen, because sometimes that's the case, right? Understandable. Then the next option, if they're at least somewhat open to it, is everybody here to like a spiritual bouquet? Are you familiar with that concept? It could be a situation where like, let's say, you were in pain, and we all said, hey, let's make a spiritual bouquet for him, because he's in the hospital. And we all say, hey, I'm gonna pray a rosary for you. I'm gonna fast for three days for you. And we all write this down, and we send him all the different little things that we're doing. That's a spiritual bouquet. You can do that for your family. Hey, I know your daughter's sick. I want you to know I'm fasting these three days for them, or I'm doing this for them. And just live that model for them, which is even more impactful than I'm praying for you. Unless they're shut down to the situation altogether, then you might have to, in that case, just do it and maybe not say it as much until you build that relationship in person with them even further. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think on, on top of that is it's the mystery that comes from opening up yourself to the Holy Spirit. Like, there's no answers to, like, 
there's no human answers that would be able to satisfy your answer until you would open yourself to the Holy Spirit and then just see what happens. But it's the slow turning that really, um, it's, it's the patience of listening to what he wants you to do. And it, the, the timing is, I mean, we laugh about it all the time about the stuff that happens with us is, is just, you can't make it up, you know? I mean, it's, it's all the time. So it's just, it, it just comes in that relationship and just listening and then he'll tell you what to do. I'd like to just point out these guys right here. Did your fraternity have a name? Holy Moments Fraternity. Holy Moments Fraternity. These three, these four guys here and two other guys who couldn't make it tonight are from which parish? St. Pius. St. Pius. Pius Parish over in Ohio. In Edgewood, Edgewood, Kentucky. Different state. Edgewood, Kentucky. <laughs> these guys, uh, we have not just Exodus 90, but as I may have mentioned earlier, we have over a thousand days of spiritual disciplines, reflections, exercises for you. 20 of which makes up our series of formation that walks through human, spiritual, intellectual, and apostolic formation as you move our way from Genesis into the New Testament, covering mostly the Old Testament there and the books that make up the story of salvation history. So we know who we are as you go through this formation. These men have been together, faithfully meeting every single week, doing prayer, asceticism, and fraternity, different sets of disciplines for every one of those exercises. They've done all 20. And what are you doing next? St. Michael's. St. Michael's now. I just want to uh, affirm the Holy Spirit's work in them and, and affirm you guys for your commitment to your families and those that you love. So if you guys wouldn't mind. I don't know if you're Thank you, fellas. We'll take two more questions and we'll wrap up. Send you five. It was originally written, uh, obviously, for a Catholic uh, man. The only kind of way of telling it is it crossing over into Protestant or even non-Christian. Non yes, yeah, so we said it's originally written for Catholic men and it hasn't been crossing over to other denominations or even non-Christian. The answer is yes to all of the above. So when I rewrote Exodus 90, I very much care about unity in the church. So follow me fully with the next statement that I made. The word Catholic often draws a hard line of division. This is a Catholic thing. Okay, we've just drawn a line. You're either Catholic or you're not. Is that helping the body of Christ to bring the greatest unity possible? The word Catholic appears in Exodus 90 zero times. The Pope, when he speaks to all the Christian faithful, whether it be in an apostolic exhortation or in a Wednesday audience, speaks to the Christian people because that is who we are. are. He speaks to all of us. And so that word is what you see in Exodus 9 and, and in our exercises for a reason, to draw unity. Does that mean, Nathaniel, that you're kind of like scared of your Catholicism? No. We still certainly quote the saints and we speak the truth with great love and great charity. We just remove some words that might trigger people to say, I'm not listening to this, and thus eliminate their encounter with the truth. Is our purpose and end goal utter conversion of these souls? Well, it wouldn't be a forward statement that I would make. In, in especially in the presence of maybe people who are not Catholic. At the same time, though, if this is the fullness of the truth, why would I not want, not want that just as much for them as I do for myself and those who are a part of this church? So does that answer your question? A little bit. Uh, so yes, we've had both Christians, we've had non-Christians, -Christian, we've had atheists all do exosomy. And just the aspects of, like, I want to be a better man, I want to stop looking at my phone all the time, I want to be more present to my wife and children, that applies to all of us. So the light phone exists for a reason and other things like that. Even at our Exodus 90 conference that we just had in Indy, we had a guy who's been a Lutheran his whole life, helped start a Lutheran parish. And he's totally gung ho on Exodus multiple times and has led, led others to do it as well. So we're very much open to encountering Jesus Christ in various citizens of journey, regardless of what line you draw in the sand. Good question. I appreciate that. One more? Tyler. How do you bridge the gap to secularism? I have 
extremely atheist co-workers and family members as well who it's a huge gap between my daily faith and um, their daily life you know like I feel like the more I grow in faith it, the, the bigger the gap is and the harder it is to reach them yeah the St. Paul quotation comes to mind about being all things to all people that by any means you might say some so relating to them as much as you can taking out those lines as I kind of mentioned as much as you can not to fall into sin yourself right? it's not like you'd go to the strip clubs with them all the members of that girls team are girls okay for a reason but you can certainly meet them where they're at go have a beer with them right meet them on their level grow an actual authentic relationship so that they know that you love them before you actually hammer anything into them so that they're ready to receive when you're ready to present what you've already been showing them with your actions. Is that a fair start? Yeah. It's different for every second situation, but I hope that works as a fair start. Sweet. Hey, thanks so much for your time tonight, man. I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, I'll close a prayer, or Father. Sure. Right. I'll close a prayer, and uh, yeah, do please feel free to hang out. I will hang out as late as anybody wants, and uh, we'll have a great night as fraternal man here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I give you thanks and praise for the models that the saints have lived for us of the Christian life. Thank you for St. Lawrence, who's gone before us, the namesake of this church and this feast day that we celebrate today. Thank you for the life that he gave for you, for his people, for your people, teaching us to do the same teaching us to live the life that you live, showing us that it can be done, that we can give absolutely everything up, even our very lives, for you, if and only if we rely on your grace and we open ourselves to your grace through a disciplined life of prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. I pray for each and every man here tonight that he might have received your life, your desire, your command to him to go and to live a life of prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. And that his life might be so abundantly filled with graces, not just tonight, but ongoing through the rest of his life. So abundant that those he loves, his family, his friends, his co-workers, might receive grace overflowing from him onto them, simply because of his yes, his openness, his one more step closer to you. And I ask for all those who are here tonight to be open, saying yes, living prayer, asceticism, and fraternity in the way that you desire. If that's in St. Michael's Lent, that they might go forth to do that. If that's in Exodus 90, that they might go forth to do that. If that's in another means to live prayer, asceticism, and fraternity, that you might give them the courage to invite men alongside them in their workplace, in their communities, to join them to live fraternity every single day with each other, pushing each other to draw closer to you. And Mary, we ask your intercession. Wherever we go astray, pick us up, press us to your breast, and lead us straight to Christ in his most sacred heart. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Lawrence. Pray for us. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, fellas. Round of applause for Nathaniel. A few announcements, if I could just have your ears for a little bit, and then, as Nathaniel said, we'd love to hang around, stick out, uh, hang out, and be with each other. Uh, first of all, on your tables, there are uh, Exodus 90 koozies. If you could all just pick one up right now. And if you put that in your pocket, and take that with you. These are actually left over from last year. There's also stickers, so pick one of those up, put that in your pocket, and then actually put this in your you actually, you take the paper off, and then you put this in your shower, like right under the shower head. And then every morning you're reminded of what you should do. <laughs> and if you don't believe the benefits of cold showers, just go to YouTube and type in cold showers Jonathan Meyer, and you can listen to my video <laughs> on the 10 reasons why you should take cold showers every day. Why cold showers are actually 
better than warm showers. Bet clearly better than hot showers, which are actually really actually bad for you on so many different levels. But anyway, cold showers and holy hours, check that out. Take one with you, put it in your pocket. We have uh, these handouts we're going to pass out. And uh, before you get out of here, make sure we have one of these and flip pass those around. I'm just going to quickly give you a tutorial uh, verbally. So on the front side, it says Men's Ministry in Dearborn County. So this is what I would love. I would love not to have to have programming because like programming is in a big sense, like we shouldn't need programming because a bunch of men should just be like living their faith, like totally on fire. And like, you should be holding each other accountable. If we, if we, if we, if we embraced what was said tonight, like we don't need programs and agendas, but the reality is, is that we do do because like we don't do it on our own, right? So this is our quick calendar. Uh, we have That Man Is You, which is a national program, videos, fraternity, and prayer. That uh, is on Thursday mornings here at St. Lawrence. October 27th, if you would like to have a beard like Nathaniel, uh, or at least just try to grow some facial hair, uh, I write daily reflections for the entire month of November. And we grow beards. And it's the Nazarite Challenge, No Shave November, but a Catholic twist and version to that. Um, we also crown Jesus as the king of our parishes, and that, that is a men's event that we do. So we come to Mass that weekend and help us crown Jesus as the men, as, as the king of our, our hearts, our homes, uh, our parish, and our world. Exodus 90, we have a kickoff meeting on January 3rd to, to form fraternity groups. And then January 9th, Exodus 90 officially begins in 2023. If you've never done Exodus 90, we would love you to do it. And as I, as I will always say, we need individuals who have done Exodus 90 to be the ones who go out and get five men from their workplace, like Tyler's workplace, and say, I'm challenging you to do Exodus 90 with me and if you can't do this and you're not a real man, and I'll punch you in the face. But whatever it takes, <laughs> but like, the, the goal is if you've done Exodus 90, particularly if you've done Exodus 90 more than once, the goal is that you should be going out and finding guys and bringing them in. That's called discipleship. And we always need to continually be reminded to work, and work on that. And then February 18th is our East Six Catholic Men's Conference, uh, the largest Catholic Men's Conference in the state of Indiana. And we would love to be a part of it. The speakers are announced on the back of this sheet. These are the two lead keynotes uh, that we have this year. Uh, Matt Burke from the NFL and Bear uh, Woznik, I think is how I pronounce his name. Woznik, Woznik, sorry. Um, so they're on there, you can learn about them, share that uh, good news, get that out there ASAP. And then we have our continual meetings of the Kingsmen, the Knights of Columbus. So there's great things happening, great things all over the place for men. We just need to get off our phones, get out of our houses, get out of our recliners, and get to brothers so we can be brothers to each other and love the Lord uh, in a more profound way. Yes? One other great event for men in the city of Cincinnati on October 15th is the Holy Name Eucharistic Procession through downtown Cincinnati. It starts with Mass at the Cathedral with uh, the Bishop, and then we have a two-mile procession through downtown Cincinnati. We'd love to have Indiana neighbors come and join us. There's that as well. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, yeah, I'm going to give you a quick blessing and then you can be on your way. Or hang on. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Be the session of St. Lawrence, deacon and martyr. May Almighty God bless you, protect you, and watch over you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Father.